morning and welcome to this first Sunday in Lent. It's lovely to be able to gather together here today to lift our praises to the Lord, to lift our prayers to the Lord and to hear his word in scripture. Uh, we pray that he will speak to us today. So let's just have a, a moment of quiet reflection and then I'll lead us in prayer. Our loving Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've called us out of the things we've been doing to come and unite together as Christians, although scattered, together lifting our voices to you, lifting our prayers to you and lifting our praise to you. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who is with us in the everyday, but the God who meets us in this way too. And so as we start to reflect um, a little bit on um, the journey that you made through the incarnation, throughout your time on earth, in the build-up to Easter, Lord, we pray that you would come and meet with us today, that your Holy Spirit would unite with us so that your will may be our will too. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm number 111. And I'm going to read some of these verses to you now. I will thank the Lord with all my heart in the meeting of the just and their assembly. Great are the works of the Lord to be pondered by all who love them. Majestic and glorious his work. His justice stands firm forever. He makes us remember his wonders. The Lord is compassion and love. He gives food to those who fear him. Keeps his covenant ever in mind. He has shown his might to the people by giving them the lands of the nations. His works are justice and truth. His precepts are all of them sure, standing firm for ever and ever. They are made in uprightness and truth. He has sent deliverance to his people and established his covenant for ever. Holy his name to be feared. To fear the Lord is the first stage of wisdom. All who do so prove themselves wise. His praise shall last forever. And so we're going to lift our praises to the Lord as we sing together. You following the words in the description below. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Hide me now, my refuge be.
We turn now in our scriptures to the book of Job, and we're going to read today from chapter 1, starting at verse 13 through to 22. So the book of Job, chapter 1, starting at verse 13. Job's children, wealth, are destroyed. One day when Job's children were having a feast at the home of their eldest brother, a messenger came running to Job. We were ploughing the fields with the oxen, he said, and the donkeys were in a nearby pasture. Suddenly the Sabians attacked and stole them all. They killed every one of your servants except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Lightning struck the sheep and the shepherds and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Three bands of Chaldean raiders attacked us, took away the camels and killed all your servants except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Your children were having a feast at the home of your elder son when a storm storm swept in from the desert. It blew the house down and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up and tore his clothes in grief. He shaved his head and threw himself face downward on the ground. He said, I was born with nothing and I will die with nothing. The Lord gave and now he takes away. May his name be praised. In spite of everything that had happened, Job did not sin by blaming God. Well, usually when I preach, I do it um, exegetically, meaning that I look at the word from scripture and I preach about it. But I also recognise that uh, at times in scripture, I must look at scripture according to issues of the day. And indeed, this is exactly what Jesus did when he was um, confronted with questions from those who followed him. Whether the question came from a Pharisee, a rich young man there, or a number of truth seekers here, he, he, would, he would deal with the question and he would turn to scripture to try to answer. So sometimes that's how we have to answer questions that are confronting us as well. And this week I've had drop into my inbox two invitations. First, an invitation to take part in the review on home abortions. These are the abortions that have been uh, legal during this coronavirus crisis that allow uh, women at home to take some pills and abort a pregnancy for up to 10 weeks within that pregnancy. And the question that I was asked in this review is, should these be allowed to continue? The second invitation that I had that dropped into my inbox this week was the invitation to sign a petition to voice concern ahead of a a commons debate uh, over the use of um, euthanasia. It will not surprise you to hear that I am no advocate for uh, euthanasia or assisted suicide in this country either. These are two, um, two things, abortion and euthanasia, that really threaten uh, the sanctity of life, the sacredness of life. And so I'm going to preach with you a little bit with these issues in mind today, but also that passage that we heard from Scripture. Well, the message during the pandemic has made us, many of us, I think, examine closely our own mortality. The numbers of uh, COVID-related deaths have appeared on our television screens, in our newspapers regularly, and seeing the number of people dying each day, it's jarred all of us, I imagine, living in a postmodern society who are often not confronted on a daily basis by the prospect of death. I believe that this reason, the reason that we're not confronted with death, is why abortions have been allowed to happen. 
the unborn baby in our society is referred to as a fetus referring it to as a, uh, referring to it as a fetus dehumanizes it and it detracts from the murder that is actually taking place when the abortion cons uh, is um, gone ahead with especially in many cases when it goes ahead quite uh, late on in the pregnancy a lot later than the 10 weeks for the uh, home abortion kits and in the same way assisted suicide is considered um, and I think that is considered in a way that means that if we put death to one side it uh, can fit with how we view ourselves in this world which is almost as being immortal although in the back of our minds we know that we're not I think part of the issue with euthanasia is that as humans we feel we have control over so much that perhaps this last thing that we have very little control of uh, over in fact no control of we're all going to die is the subject of death, isn't it? So I think in some people's minds, if they can deal with that by being able to choose when they die, it seems like some control is brought back. However, it's really not a good situation to be in. And it used to be said not so long ago, actually, that the Victorians were obsessed with talking about death. It confronted them and it shaped them. Uh, it probably meant that they were a more godly society as a result of it, whilst it was a great taboo for them to speak about sex. And if you think about that, that shows uh, godly living in their lives. They were well aware from whom all life came from, and they were well aware of um, living moral lives. But today it would seem that plenty of people are happy to speak about sex, whilst perhaps death has become a taboo subject for all of us to speak about and uh, that's probably why abortion and euthanasia are considered in the way that they are today and it also shows the way that our society has changed from being a godly society to one that is becoming lawless this morning we break the taboo and we do speak about dying now this is a subject that confronts us all some of us, it might be something that we're having to deal with in the immediate stages of our lives. For others of us, it might be something that we push to the back of our, our minds, but actually, considering the subject of dying helps us to look to God, helps us to look from beyond the immediate situation to actually looking into eternity. And it gives us a perspective that is far more based on eternity than what we have right now. There are two things that are for certain in life. One is that we will, um, we will live after our birth, and the second is that we will die at the end of our lives, whenever that is. And we speak endlessly, even in church, don't we, about how we should live now. And that's important. But now we should also consider the much longer period of time that is gonna happen after we have been living in this life on earth. That is how we should die and how that should reflect into eternity. This morning I'll draw what the Bible says. I'll draw on some practical things from theology, from things that have been said in philosophy and the world of ethics, alongside some personal experience perhaps and things that I've encountered which I confess might be limited compared to what you have gone through or are going through. But if you're still sat thinking why should I think about death and dying? My answer is because legislation changes may mean that we are all forced to make decisions about death and dying if we haven't already been having to make them in our lives. As Christians who are living in a country that has become increasingly secularised and less influenced by the Judeo-Christian uh, law through the church, we cannot necessarily any longer conclude that the law of the land is pleasing to God. Friends, 
we are approaching, and the Bible tells us to expect this, a time of lawlessness. That isn't that there'll be no laws, it's just that our laws will not reflect God's law. There's a turning away from God's law. This is a sign of the end of the age. In Matthew 24, it speaks about this. So whilst it's a heartache to us that people are turning away from God's ways, we also rejoice that it means that Jesus is coming back soon. Hallelujah to that. And let us begin with the belief then in the sanctity of life that is fundamental to God's law. So the sanctity of life can be described as this. Life is God-given. Human life is precious. God has a plan for every human life. All life deserves respect. Therefore, life should not be destroyed. Abortion and euthanasia are both a direct attack on this imperative gift of God. Euthanasia is a term used alongside other words like assisted suicide, and it's something that threatens the sanctity of life, and is a word derived from the Greek language. But whatever word you want to put on it, whatever phrase you want to put around it, it is the taking of life before time. Let's dig deeper. Let's dig deeper, though, to what it tries to tell us, or what giving this name tries to tell us. It means a good death. Well, we know it doesn't. If a person believes in euthanasia, it means that they're in favour of allowing the right to commit suicide or be killed by others. Quite frankly, this is murder. Usually, when a person has an incurable disease or excruciating painful med medication, these are the types of practices that some people would say should be brought in. And there are two kinds of euthanasia. The first is passive euthanasia. This is allowing people who are being kept alive artificially to die by perhaps switching off a life support machine or taking away a feeding tube. In effect, they die from their illness or injury, but not always. Sometimes they die because the, the medication or the help is removed. And there's been a problem with this in recent times, where decisions by doctors and in the courts of this land have prevented people from being moved to another country to continue receiving care that other countries are willing to give. And instead, without permission, the state has stepped in and refused that this person can travel to a different country and have at the same time refused to give them the medicines and supplements to the individual to keep them alive. Just in the past few weeks, a man of Polish heritage was denied by our state the opportunity to be flown back to Poland where efforts were going to be made to keep him alive. And he was kept a prisoner here. Not only was he kept a prisoner here in our hospitals, but he was denied the necessities of life that he would have received and he starved and dehydrated and his body shut down. And I don't know about you, but to me, that does not seem passive. That does not seem like a good death. It seems deliberate and cruel. Woe to each person who made the decision to deprive the man of the opportunity to go on living and to take his life. The second thing, and this is what people are increasingly talking about uh, now and the debate's going to go on about um, in Parliament, is active euthanasia. That is killing someone to end suffering or committing suicide or assisting someone to commit suicide. And this might be by a lethal injection or an overdose. And in Britain, passive euthanasia, the one that I've just spoken about, is legal but active euthanasia is not currently. But there is pressure trying to make it so. But passive euthanasia was established in the High Court when an action by a pressure group against turning off the life support machine of a brain-dead Hillsborough victim, Tony Bland, was thrown out of court. Legally, doctors can decide to switch off life support machines after consulting with relatives. In Britain, though, active euthanasia remains illegal. 
although as I said there is growing pressure for it to be legalised and it is legal in some countries and people will travel from our country on occasions to somewhere like Holland where they can go through the process of ending their life by active euthanasia. Now we've got the de definitions out of the way, let's begin by looking at where the problem starts. It starts with the age-old problem of suffering and this problem is one of the oldest problems in existence, isn't it? Why? Why is there suffering? Why if this world is in the hands of a loving God do people suffer and die from illness, from natural disasters, through drought and famine? The world we inhabit seems to be flawed and unfair. The Bible doesn't attempt, though, to gloss over this. It portrays a world which is damaged from the condition that God originally intended it to be in. There was not supposed to be suffering that went on. In the scriptures, we see that in the beginning that God created everything and it was good. And in Matthew 24, we read that uh, things will happen that cause suffering, but that are uh, uh, signs of the times, and signs of time returning to a point where things are all good again, under God's control, as he intended them to be. The scriptures say that this spoiling, it says, has taken place because of a turning away from God. If we turn to God, we're on our way back to eternity. We're on our way back to salvation, where things are as they should be. But if we turn away from God, we continue to turn away and be in a situation where things are bad and getting worse. And we see this pattern throughout scripture. As mankind, as humankind has turned away from God, things continue to get worse. Yet God's response is not to abandon his creation, but through Jesus to enter into it. And through Jesus, even suffering himself on a cross, to partake in what we go through, that we might be saved. Yet we, lived in a world, we live in a world that is obsessed with eradicating suffering. Even God could not avoid suffering in this world. But yet, we seem fixated on trying to avoid suffering at any cost. Even if it means eradicating life. Even if taking away suffering means to remove the life of an unborn baby from the mother's womb. Even if it means ending someone's life early when they could have more time with loved ones, or they could have a moment of encounter with God that sets them secure for all eternity. Friends, times are changing, and attitudes towards the sanctity of life are changing too. Society is turning back, turning back to the things that led us into this mess, turning back into a, a lawless society, and at the same time, turning its back on God. Society has moved away from the belief that abortion is wrong. And it's moving away from the attitude that assisted suicide is always wrong. No longer do the laws that have been laid down by God in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, through his servant Moses, no longer do these things, these laws, echo the norm for the laws that run our society. There is a turning away from these things. Some people in society are now not saying, thou shalt not murder, or thou shalt not kill. But now they're saying, thou shalt not kill, except in certain circumstances, when the suffering is too great or when the benefit to others can be made. There is increasing pressure on the church in all aspects of life to conform to worldview in many things. We see this pressure and we see lots of the church just crumbling and accepting the worldview on many things that it shouldn't and turning its back on God's law. And this is now a greater challenge 
because the laws of our land, as I said, are moving away from those laws laid down by God through Moses. Those things are no longer our foundation. And indeed, there are Christians who now openly support abortion happening, claiming that it protects the mother. Furthermore, there are Christian voices now who also support euthanasia based on Christian love. It's unthinkable, isn't it, that you could base taking somebody's life on human love, on a human understanding of love, and then call it Christian love. But this is what people do. It's a mixed up way of thinking. And the professor Paul Badham says this, Christians can be inconsistent by arguing that God alone should choose the moment of our death because it is clear that we don't actually think that because, for example, if someone stops breathing, we set about resuscitating them. And whenever there is the hope of a cure or recovery, we use all the resources of medicine to prolong a person's life past what otherwise would have been inevitable. In the same way, Professor Baden would argue that there is no hope that if there's no hope of recovery and someone is suffering tremendously, it is then appropriate for the doctor to provide the means to enable the person to release themselves from that suffering. He says that palliative care, the, the, the care that's received in hospices, is not always appropriate, especially during long intergenerative illnesses. But you see, the problem here is that when you treat someone and you resuscitate them, you are not betraying any of the laws that are laid down. You are valuing life so highly that you want it to continue. But by ending somebody's life prematurely, you are committing murder. You are killing somebody and therefore not fulfilling the law. Paul Badham would use what he says about the golden rule of Christ to treat others as we'd like to be treated, arguing that euthanasia means having a gentle and easier death, and then that this is the fulfilment of that rule. Well, we've already established from what happened to the man in the UK recently who had his feeding tube removed, that this does not necessarily mean a gentle and kinder and easier death. If we are to take, though, the position of Paul Badham seriously, and we should because there are enough people arguing his point, let's consider the story of somebody who did go through the process of assisted suicide, Dan James. In 2008, 23-year-old Dan James, who had broken his neck in a rugby accident, ended his life supported by his family by Dignitas. In an email to the Times, his mother Julie explained her decision to help Dan kill himself and she wrote this. Three weeks ago our son was at last allowed his wish of a dignified death in Dignitas apartment in Zurich. He couldn't walk, he had no function but constant pain in all his fingers. He was incontinent, he suffered uncontrollable spasms in his legs and upper body. And, the, and needed 24-hour care. Dan had tried to commit suicide three times, but this was unsuccessful due to his disability. His only other option was to starve himself. Dan had been a lively and hugely active young man. He was highly intelligent, lovable, and so loved by his family. Whilst not everyone in Dan's situation would find his state unbearable, what right does any human being have to tell anyone other that they have to live such a life filled with terror, discomfort and indignity? What right does one person who, <coughs> excuse me, who chooses to live with a particular illness or disability have to tell another that they should have to do that? Nobody but nobody to judge him or anybody else. I wonder, do you have a judgment on this situation? Should we judge the actions that Dan took? What would we say to his mother? She asked us 
today what the consequences of Dan's actions would mean. Are you able to put yourself in Dan's shoes? Can you even begin to think about what action you might take if you were in his situation? These questions are difficult for us to fathom, aren't they? I would never condemn or blame Dan for his decision. What an utterly awful predicament he and his family were in. That's for God to judge, not for me, not for you. However, as a Christian, I am resolved to never want active euthanasia legalised in this country on a number of grounds. I believe that life comes from God and it is only for God to take that away and not for other human beings or ourselves to do so. God alone is sovereign over when and how a person's death occurs. And Job testifies to this in in his book. I know you will bring me down to death to the place appointed for all living, he says. In Ecclesiastes, Uh, It says, it is declared, no man has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the way of his death. God has the final say. It says similar things in the book of Corinthians, in Hebrews, in the book of Revelation. Check it out. It seems to me, though, that euthanasia could be man's way of trying to usurp God's authority. We have a track record of trying to do that. In the Bible, in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul says that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this means that the body is holy and should not be destroyed for any reason. Imagine destroying God's temple. Is that ever something you would consider? No. So don't think about destroying your body or someone else's. God dwells and lives in there. And it seems to me, obviously, that death is a natural occurrence. Sometimes God allows a person to suffer for a long time before death occurs. We can't get our head around that. But perhaps there's some purpose in it. Other times the person's suffering is cut short. Sometimes death comes with no warning at all. And that can be incredibly painful for family and loved ones as well. No one enjoys suffering, but that does not make it right to determine that a person is ready to die. Often God's purposes are made known through a person's suffering. When times are good, be happy, the Bible says, but when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Suffering is a time to consider God. Romans chapter 5 teaches that tribulations bring about perseverance. God cares about those who are crying out for death to end their suffering. God gives purpose to life even to the end. And only God knows what is best. And his timing is best even when someone is faced with death. His timing, friends, is perfect. It could very be, very well be the difference between being saved by God's grace or not. And he loves you so much that he will do anything he can to have his children come back to him. So when you're suffering, turn to God. Be with God. Dwell with God. And because I believe in life after death, I do not accept that ending life prematurely is reasonable. Death is not the end. And hard as it might seem to us now, suffering may be serving some purpose. Just look at what suffering and death followed by resurrection achieved through Jesus. That is the most wonderful picture we have. All seemed lost. And yet... On the third day, he rose again and offered life in eternity for everyone who would follow him. But my overriding belief is to follow the example of Jesus and his attitude of selfless love towards others. 
we should, on this issue, on these issues, still feel compassion for mothers who are in a predicament that they feel they want to abort their unborn babies. We should be in a position where, as followers of Christ, we feel compassion for the terminally ill and mean that we support their efforts in trying to achieve a more comfortable death. But this should not include either abortion or euthanasia at either end of the life scale. And indeed, the hospice movement seeks to provide a peaceful and comfortable environment for people to die in. This palliative care, I believe, is the epitome of Christ-like action. People facing death with people they're caring for every day, trying to bring them comfort, giving them the opportunity to have some dignity in their last days, but also to have access to the family loved ones, chaplains and the word of God in their last days. Changing the law to allow suffering will cause tremendous problems because it will cause a change in how future generations would think about life and death. People will think there's no ethical debate about euthanasia anymore, much as they do now about abortion. There's no debate about whether abortion should be allowed or legalised in this country. It's just now where it can be done and how late it can be done. There should still be debate in this country. The church should stand up, united together, and say it is never right to take someone's life. Because these decisions, the acceptance of both abortion and euthanasia, they will affect everyone. Euthanasia will become a treatment option when faced with the terrible effects of illness. And having not considered the issue of dying until confronted with it, because in our world we don't think about dying, there would be that confrontation at a time of great weakness. And people will constantly be asking the question of themselves, when is enough enough? And they shouldn't have to think about that. I would argue that the loving thing to do is not to present a vulnerable person with such a question at a time when they're, when they're under so much insecurity, when they have so much going on, when their judgment is impaired, but to take care of that person and ease their burden with the medicine and palliative care. I believe that that is the way that we imitate Christ. Whilst teaching in a secondary school, philosophy and ethics, I've been forced into becoming a bit of a philosophical, philosopher, that's not easy to say, a philosophical thinker, albeit a very amateurish one who can't even say the word. And during this time, I've realised that much of the foundation of Judeo-Christian law influenced by man, um, has been influenced by a man rather, called Thomas Aquinas, to try to set out ways that society could understand it and apply it. He came up with the just war theory and only under those theories, uh, um, set of theories, could people go to war in a legal way and the world follows this uh, in many ways today. And likewise there is his natural law theory which sets out a blueprint on how we should live our lives. He concentrates his theory through primary precepts through Aquinas, it's quite clear about the preservation of life, about what the Bible says and what should be applied in our society. The primary precept that he has is, about the fundam is fundamental to the law of God and it is that life should be at all times preserved. And the secondary precepts that we've taken from this and applied in our society have been that we should not commit suicide that we do not take away people's lives in any way. <clears throat> now, a major flaw in this is that the natural law does not consider uh, the consequences. For example, the degree for which a person might suffer. Uh, these things haven't been considered, and that's why the natural law that Thomas Aquinas set out has been challenged so much in society today. But if a Christian we need to choose where we stand. 
And we should stand, I believe, with preserving life. We should follow that natural law, the law given by God that thou shalt not kill. But we should make sure that we do that not by ignoring Jesus' command to love each other also. A Christian course of action must supply continual and endless care and medicine to help people in their times of suffering. That should be what compels us. We should be the ones who are standing there with those who are suffering, helping in many ways, and that's where the church has been at its best when doing that. We need to help people who suffer and not just say, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. Otherwise, we seem unloving. So we must both follow the law as handed down to Moses by God, that we should not kill, but we also need to follow that golden rule of love by Jesus. At funeral services, near the end of the service, I read from the book of Job, when Job is suffering, and he still offers praise to God. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart, he says. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. The word Lord, when it's capitalised like this, as in this passage, means Yahweh. It's the name of God. The very name of God is praised. And the Bible teacher David Pawson translates this name of Yahweh as being always. And this is how we should think of God. Knowing that your God is always with you, is there in the good times and in the bad times, Knowing that his name is always, meaning that he is always with you, can help us get through those times of suffering in our lives. And knowing that he is always with us means that he is there when that suffering ends and we are united to him forever in all holiness and beauty and glory far into eternity. May you bless God in the good times but may you draw close to him also in the bad times. May you bless his name today and tomorrow and every day into the future. The reminder that God is always must to us also be a reminder that we must always go on praising him, for he is always with us. Amen. <coughs> Well, if you have a look in the description below, you'll see that our next hymn is Lord for the Years. It's Lord for the Years, your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired us, cheered us on our way. So let us sing together this hymn.
come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for our lives. We thank you that in the good times we are able to praise you. And we pray, Lord, that as we see people who are suffering at this time, we ask, Lord, that you may meet with them, that praise to you may be on their lips. We pray, Lord, that you would soften their hearts, that they would experience you even in those most trying times. We pray, Lord, that you would give them the comfort that they long for, the comfort that they need, the trust to leave loved ones with you and in your hands, to have peace in their hearts over those issues. For you are a good God. And Lord, as we look into the hospitals and we still see that they're so full with patients of all different kinds, but especially patients um, from the COVID virus, we thank you for those who nurse and care. And we pray, Lord, that their objective may always be in our hospitals to protect life, to help those who suffer, and that there shall be opportunities always, Lord, for people to meet with you, even in their last days, even in those hardest times. So we lift people to you today who are experiencing that in our hospitals, in their homes, in various different walks of life. We ask, Lord, that you would comfort and meet and grant them everlasting peace. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let us pray now the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May God be with you today. May he bless you and keep you. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.